it was just a short time ago that uh, we thought of breast cancer as a cancer in the breast, as, a, as, a, uh, as an entity that we understood as, as, as one thing. Um, and a transformation occurred in our thinking already many years ago, although it took a while to reach consciousness, uh, in the concept that cancer can be, breast cancers can be estrogen sensitive or estrogen dependent, and, and we could estimate that by uh, looking at the receptors for estrogen in the cancer, or estrogen independent, uh, and those tumors were estrogen receptor negative. Um, remarkably, I mean, we, we've been following um, uh, that observation with, with therapeutic approaches, particularly uh, giving drugs that could interfere with the estrogen receptor um, uh, for many, many years. But it was only a few years ago that uh, Martin Picard, who's a great uh, scientist, clinical scientist, uh, clinician, and really a leader of European and world oncology, she's in Brussels, uh, gave an impassioned speech at a meeting that we have every two years in St. Gallen, Switzerland. It just happened, the, the, the most recent one just happened a few, a few weeks ago. Uh, that we should really do different trials for estrogen receptor positive and estrogen receptor negative disease. By then it was also apparent that there was a third classification, which is disease that was dependent on uh, another receptor on the surface of the cancer cell called HER2. Uh, and that also can be targeted with an antibody against that receptor called, or called trastuzumab and popularly known as Herceptin. And it's remarkable that, that the, the knowledge that we're dealing with more than one disease took, took really probably two decades before it uh, sunk into the minds of the investigators that we should be doing different trials in those diseases. And, and since that time, there's really been a revolution of thought where everybody involved in the breast cancer world um, knows that there's no such thing as breast cancer. There are many different kinds of cancers that can arise in the breast. And they all could be characterized by the molecules in the cancer that make the cancer cancerous, in other words, give it, give it its fundamental identity. So to really explain this properly and sort of as a basis, and you'll see that when we get to the question and answer part, which is the thing you're really here for and my favorite part of these talks, uh, when we get to the question and answer part, um, that I'd like to lay the basis for this revolution in science so that we have at least a common vocabulary. So many of you have seen this or things like this, and forgive me if this is boring, but, but I want to bring us all up to the, all up to the same level. Um, is the, this is obviously a breast. Uh, a, a breast is really a very simple organ. It's really a specialized sweat gland. Uh, a sweat gland that's, that's specialized for the production, potentially at least, of milk. Uh, this is a side view of the breast. These are muscles here. These are ribs over here. Uh, this is the skin, as you see, on the outside. And underneath the skin is mostly fatty tissue. Most of the breast is just, is just fat. But within the breast, there are specialized structures uh, that you see here that are, are for the making of milk. Uh, this is a lobule. We'll take, we'll take this little, this, this section out. We'll put it over here. This is the lobule that, that can make milk, and these are, these are ducts that connect the lobule to a big duct. A duct is just a tube. It's, just, it's, it's like, like a hose that eventually could take the milk to the nipple. This is the, uh, a cross-section here of that duct. And as you can see, it's just a tube and is lined by normal cells, the normal lining cells of a duct, normal ductal tissue. Now, let's concentrate on this aspect of the biology of, uh, of, of the process for a second. And, and by the way, that, that this picture is not really totally accurate because all breast cancers, all of them, don't arise from a, a, a midsection of the, of, the, uh, of the duct, but rather right at the place where the duct meets the lobule. This little area here where the duct meets the lobule is the problem area. This little area over here is the problem area. This is the area really where all cancers arise. You don't see cancers arise from this part of the duct. Uh, you don't see cancers arise from the lobule itself. It arises from the junction between the lobule and the duct. This itself is really important, um, and I'll try to remember that. If I don't remember it, remind me later about why, why this is important to know. So let's concentrate now on a cross-section of a duct where it would meet the lobule. This is what the duct would look like. It's just a tube lined by normal cells. Now these cells can go abnormal on us, all right? And they go abnormal because the DNA, we'll get back to this in a second, that gives the cell instruction for how to behave becomes abnormal. And when that DNA becomes abnormal, it sends out abnormal messages. And we'll go over this again in, in more detail in a second. And one of the first changes that can occur is that you can have increased growth or a pileup of the cells in the lining of the duct. 
and we call that hyperplasia. It means increased growth. In the beginning, the cells look perfectly normal. There are just too many of them. But as they pile up, they can look abnormal, and we call that atypical hyperplasia. And you might have heard of atypical ductal hyperplasia or ADH. Some of you have probably heard that uh, before. And what that is is an, is an abnormal pileup of cells, and it's not cancer cells. These aren't cancer cells. They're normal cells that are a little bit abnormal, and they tend to pile up. Um, the next step in abnormality that may develop is that the cells may clog up the whole duct, and now the cells look quite abnormal. Each cell is quite abnormal in and of itself, and it clogs up the duct. And, and these cells look like cancer cells under the microscope, each individual one. And we call it ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS. Uh, it's also sometimes called intraductal carcinoma, means carcinoma in the duct. Uh, not to be confused with something called infiltrating ductal carcinoma, which is, a, which is a different entity. We'll get to that next. But the proper term for it is DCIS. Uh, that's the proper term for it, ductal carcinoma in situ. And these cells look like cancer cells, but they stay in the duct. And as long as they stay in the duct, they're not going to cause you any trouble. They're just going to stay right there. It's a local problem, something we identify uh, with a microscope uh, when we examine these cells. But it's not problematic, and it's never going to cause you any trouble. But what can happen is the cells can become more abnormal and break out of the duct, as you see in this picture here. And that's what we mean by infiltrating ductal cancer. It's infiltrating out of the duct into the surrounding area of the breast. And these are the cells that can cause, cause trouble. And these are the cells that can spread to lymph nodes, spread to other parts of the body, and, uh, and, and become potentially life-threatening because of their ability to spread and grow in other places where they spread. And we'll get back to that also in a second. So this is a picture of what you've just seen. Normal duct, uh, the development of atypical ductal hyperplasia, ductal carcinoma in situ where the cells can pile up. Uh, they can start to get microinvasion where they start to break through out of the duct or they can frankly break through the duct completely. And then we call it infiltrating ductal cancer. And this is the one that we really worry about. This is a problem because um, it is a precursor to this. And when we see uh, cells, when we, see a, a, we do a biopsy and we see this, we know that this is a potentially a problem for the patient because if it's not properly treated, it could go on and become an infiltrating cancer. And these are the cells that could spread to other parts of the body. And that's why we take care of this. When these cells divide here in the middle, they don't all survive. Some of these cells die. And when they die, uh, they attract calcium. If you banged your elbow sometimes, you can get calcific bursitis, or you can, get, you can get calcium deposits. Calcium tends to accumulate in any part of the body where there's damage. And if the cells die, they, you can get a calcium deposit in them. And we can see that little flex of calcium with a mammogram. And so when we see a calcium deposit, it's an indicator that you may have some ductal carcinoma in situ. And of course, we have to biopsy that because that ductal carcinoma in situ, at least in some part of the breast, might have progressed into infiltrating ductal cancer. Any questions so far? Is this clear? OK. All right. So now this is a you know, more common looking picture. This is the breast. And, and, and the breast it, itself, as, 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 as I showed you earlier, is um, uh, mostly fatty tissue and the specialized cells that could make milk or carry milk to the nipple. But like every other tissue in the body, every other part of the body, there is a flow of something called lymph uh, in the body and into the breast and out of the breast. What lymph is, is that is when your blood pumps, when, when blood pumps into all the tissues of the body, for the blood to nourish the body, it has to leave the blood vessel. And that what, that's what gives your, the, that's what puts moisture in all the tissues of your body. Well, that moisture is delivering essential nutrients to all the cells of the body, but that moisture has to get back into the blood some way so it can continue to circulate. And the way it does that is it flows along lymph channels and the lymph channels flow in an orderly direction and eventually dump back into a vein, which dumps into the heart, and then the blood can flow to the rest of the body. Along the way on the lymph channels, there are lymph nodes. What nodes are is just collections of white blood cells along the lymph channels so that in case you get a cut, for example, or an infection gets in, that those bacteria going along the lymph channel will hit a lymph node where the white cells of the lymph node will destroy that, the, that bacteria. This is a built-in system in the body to prevent you getting serious infections. That's what it's for. Well, in fact, that same pathway can be used by cancer cells to get into, into the rest of the body. Cancer cells can get into the lymphatic channels just like bacteria can and can travel along the lymph and can stop along the way in any of these lymph nodes. 
Now, we know a lot about the flow of cancer cells to the lymph because of the, the discovery, the invention of something uh, called sentinel lymph node mapping. And what sentinel lymph node mapping does is this is obviously the cancer, the cancer we've been talking about, the infiltrating cancer where the cells have left the duct, and they can flow along the lymph channels and go to another part of the body. If you inject a blue dye or a radioisotope, something with a weak radioactivity, into the area of the tumor, frankly, anywhere you inject in the breast will work, that the, the, the blue dye or the uh, radioactive material, or, or both, we tend to use both commonly so you get a better, a better sample, can then, go, can, can then go along the lymph channels, as you see here, and settle in lymph nodes. And the flow of the lymph into the lymph nodes of the dye is the same as the flow of cancer cells into the lymph nodes. So we call these sentinel nodes. A sentinel is, is the person who guards the door with a, with a, with a rifle, sword, axe, whatever they guard the door with. Um, and they, um, uh, and that they, uh, they guard the rest of the axilla so that the axilla is the armpit. So that if these lymph nodes do not contain any cancer cells, you're pretty sure, high 90%, that the rest of the lymph nodes don't contain any cancer cells, so you don't have to take any more lymph nodes out. So if the sentinel didn't pick up the cancer cells, then you know that the lymph didn't, didn't flow that way. So this has been a big chance. This, what, this little gizmo here is actually a radio, radio um, uh, is, is a, uh, a sensor for radioactive material, like a little Geiger counter, that, that if you inject uh, radioactive material, you can actually put this over the skin, pick up some of the signals that are coming from those lymph nodes, and the surgeon knows where to cut to take the lymph nodes out. And then if you also use blue dye, when you get in there, you can see that the lymph nodes are blue. And so you take out the blue ones, and you know you got the sentinel lymph nodes. So that's what sentinel lymph node mapping is, and this is the basic anatomy of breast cancer. Most of what we've done over the many years that we've been treating breast cancer is based on this anatomy, is based on the knowledge of the cancer cell growing in the ducts, spreading beyond the ducts, going into lymphatics. And, and, and this is why we have evolved the kind of surgery that we do for breast cancer because of this basic anatomy. But recent discoveries, so everything I've told you so far is pretty much classical oncology in terms of stuff that I might have learned, except for the sentinel, sentinel, sentinel lymph node mapping is relatively recent, but that, um, but that uh, everything else is stuff that I could have learned in medical school way, 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 way back when. However, recent discoveries are starting to challenge some of these views in really very important ways that have a lot to do with how we should approach cancer from a research point of view and how we should approach cancer from a therapeutic point of view. And let me illustrate that with these, with these figures here. So this is a primary tumor, a collection of cancer cells that have spread beyond the duct in a breast. These are, this, this is circulation. Uh, the blue is, uh, is venous circulation, and then the, it flows into red, which is arterial circulation. The veins pick up, the, the, pick up um, uh, blood from the tissues, pick up lymphatic, drainage from the tissues, and then it goes to the heart, and then the heart pumps it out through arteries. Now, we've known for some time, of course, that if you have a breast cancer in the breast, uh, where the cells have broken out of the duct, it could spread in the breast itself. It could push to the edge of where it is, and it could, it could grow um, uh, next to where the, where the cancerous mass is, in this, this way, pathway A. We also know, and I've as I've described to you before, that the cells can get access to the circulation, uh, can get through the lymphatics, can get into the veins, might get into the veins directly, not even going through the lymphatics, and can gain access to the circulation, all right, and then can break out in another part of the body, uh, and, like the lymph nodes, can get in circulation, go into the lymph nodes, and grow there, and we call that a metastasis. That's the definition of metastasis. Now, the lymph nodes is one place where the cells can go. The cells can also go to other parts of the body, and that's what makes breast cancer serious. If it just went to the lymph nodes, you can treat the lymph nodes, you can remove them surgically, you can treat them with radiation therapy, and you can treat the breast certainly with surgery or with radiation therapy or a combination of, of, of both, and that's not a problem. The problem is if the cells find their way into the lung or the liver or the most common place for breast cancer is the bone. Least common place, but maybe the most serious is the brain. And if the cells find themselves pathway B in that site, they can grow in that site, and they can therefore disrupt those organs, and they can cause trouble. And that's metastatic breast cancer, and that is the more serious complication of, of, of cancer. Something very recently discovered is that there is another thing that the cancer cells can do, which is they can get in the circulation, and they can come back to the breast. 
And we have very clear evidence this is true in animal models that we've been studying here for the last three years. Um, but we also have evidence, and most of this is not yet published. It's still in the process of being published. Uh, we have evidence that this can happen in human disease as well. Now, when you think about it, pathway C is a very logical pathway. I mean, the cells get into the circulation, they go through the whole body. Where are they going to be most comfortable? They're going to be most comfortable where they came from in the first place. And a New Yorker could travel the world, most likely is going to come back to New York, right? <laughs> right? I hope. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes not. You settle in, you know, Boston, you know, God help us, or you settle in Paris or someplace. And, but, but, but most of the time, people travel the world, they come back, because this is where they're most comfortable. And so, and, so, and so this is not an illogical thing. It ha however, it turns out to be a very profound thing in terms of understanding the nature of, uh, of cancer. And we'll talk about that in a second. Now look at pathway A, B, and C. What's going to happen when the cells find themselves either in a metastatic site next to the primary tumor as in A or circulating through the systemic circulation and coming back to the tumor? They're going to divide. They're going to grow. That's what cancer cells do. And when that happens, now you have increasing growth of the tumor. And you can see the primary tumor is getting bigger now, partially because it's growing, the cells are dividing, and partially because it's seeding itself. So it's sort of like a weed bed. Weeds, a bed grows because each weed plant grows, but they also seed new weed plants. And that's really the problem with weeds is not each plant. They're very small plants. They're pretty benign plants. The problem with a weed bed is they constantly seed new weed, uh, weed plants. And that's, that's the nature of the growth of, uh, of the tumor. And other things can happen once this is happening. For example, in the metastatic site, the cells can spread. You know, if it's already a lump in the liver, it could spread next door to where that lump is and start to grow next to it as a lump. It could get back into the circulation, and there it could do all the things that we were talking about before. It could spread back to itself, as in E. It could go to different metastatic sites, so it can go from bone, let's say, to, to the liver. Or it could even go back to the primary tumor, if the primary tumor is still in place. And frankly, that's one of the major reasons why after we cut the breast tumor out completely, but leave the breast intact, what we call breast conserving surgery or lumpectomy, why we irradiate the breast. We irradiate the breast because cells might have traveled back to the breast and have located in a different part of the breast. And if we didn't irradiate the breast, they would grow there. It's like pathway, pathway F. Um, uh, and also, even in the breast, the cells can exchange back and forth, which is pathway G. So the cells are moving around all the time. And what's profound about this is that we've been concentrating for a long time, well over a century, on cancer as a disease of cell division. And unquestionably, cell division is an important part of the process. But it's also, and maybe even more so, a disease of cell mobility. These cells may not be very abnormal in their cell division or in many other aspects, but they move around a lot. And the moving around a lot means that there are potentially new targets for cancer therapy that we didn't think of before and that we haven't looked at before. And this has been an exciting new area of research over the last year to try to think about developing therapeutic drugs that can affect the mobility. Now, we have one set of drugs already, or really one drug that's approved already, that is sort of relevant to this, which is uh, called bevacizumab, also called Avastin. It's a drug that affects blood vessel growth. Because as you can see, as the cells move around, one of the important things that is that when they find themselves in a new location by any of these pathways, they need blood vessels to supply them with uh, nutrients, oxygen, sugar, other nutrients that are essential for growth, vitamins. Remember, cancer cells are cells. They need vitamins just like any other cell in the body. And therefore, um, the growth of new blood vessels supports the seeding process. And, and, and by blocking the growth of new blood vessels, we may be affecting the seeding process. And there's a tremendous amount of research going on now trying to decrease the amount of blood vessel growth into the cancer for this particular reason. Now, to show you, to give you an example, I, can we cut the light a little bit in the room? Do we got control up there to actually do that so they can actually see this picture a little bit better? OK, that's good. Uh, so, well, I guess we've got lights for the, for the cameras. But you see this, this thing over here? All right. This is actually, if something is growing by seeding from the outside in, this is the way it would appear. Uh, you, you, you have another example that you all know about, which is snowflakes. Snowflakes grow because water vapor condenses on, on the core of the, of the a little ice crystal 
the core of the, of the snowflake. And that's what snowflakes look like. They're fuzzy, and they've got, they've got, they've got uh, edges. They're a little bit, because they're crystals, they're a little bit more organized, and they're, they're sort of pretty. The things that grow from the outside in tend to grow with these dendrites. Now I'm going to show you what a breast cancer looks like on an MRI of the breast. So look at this picture, and now I'm going to actually go to a human breast with an MRI showing a cancer. And you can see that that's the way it appears. It's clearly not one thing. It's a collection of little things. This is a lump. This is a lump. This is a lump. This is a lump. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. And it's got these long, skinny den dendrites. We call these dendrites sticking out at various angles. So it has the appearance of something, a collection of things, like a weed bed, uh, where the cells now, are, we, we, we believe, have circulated and have come back to the primary lesion, come back to the breast, and are growing in this location. And that, indeed, if one could stop the cells from, from moving, one can stop this process from developing. So it's an exciting area of current research. Now, how do the cells know to do this? What is the, a normal cell, Here's a picture of a normal cell. Doesn't move around. It stays where it's supposed to. You know, you got a, a cell on your nose, it stays in your nose, right? If it moved, you'd have an ugly nose. So we, none of us here have ugly noses, right? Because the nose cells stay where they're supposed to stay, right? The instruction set that tells the cell to stay where it's supposed to stay is contained in that center of the cell called the nucleus. Nucleus just means the center. And the nucleus contains this magical molecule called DNA. DNA is, is, is the essence of life. It's the molecule, molecule that has the instruction set that contains the instructions that tells the cell how to behave. Now, how do we examine the DNA? How do we know that the DNA is normal or know that the DNA is abnormal? Well, the DNA is organized in something called genes. What a gene is is the full instruction set. You can think of the gene as a full sentence whereas each component of sentence is made of words, words are made of letters. So we have analogous situation in DNA. The components of DNA can be thought of as letters, the letters are organized in words, the words are organized in sentences. The whole sentence, sentence is called a gene. And the genes work because the genes tell the cell to make proteins. The, the signal between the genes and the proteins is called RNA. So DNA is the instruction set. DNA is, uh, makes RNA. RNA makes protein. And now we have a nice normal cell, and it, gene A is making uh, two globs of protein A. Uh, gene B is turned off. And gene C is making one glob of protein C. And those proteins, A and C, are what give the normal cell its characteristics. Indeed, every cell of the body has the same DNA, you inherited half your DNA from your mother, half your DNA from your father, and you have the same genes in all the cells of your body, but some are turned on and some are turned off. If you have a lot of gene A turned on, you may have a muscle cell. If you have a lot of gene B turned on, you may have a skin cell, as you see here. If you have some of A and some of B, you may have a nerve cell. Is, is the, the turning on and off of genes is what gives the cell its information that tells the cell to behave in a certain way. So here we have a cancer cell. And the cancer cell is derived from the normal cell. And now we have a cancer cell, and it might have started off as hyperplasia, atypical hyperplasia, DCIS. Now it's an invasive cancer cell. And as you can see, it's quite different in two ways from a normal cell. It doesn't have a gene A working, so it doesn't have protein A in it. Gene B is normally turned off, and in the cancer cell it's turned on. And gene C is, not, is turned on as it is in the normal situation, but it's making an abnormal protein. We call it C asterisk. You see, I made it made with a little bit of purple here. I owe these slides to Bill Gerald, one of our great pathologists. And so now what you have is you have an abnormal collection of proteins, and that abnormal collection of proteins is selling, it's telling the cell to behave in an abnormal way. And as you've seen before, two of the characteristics that make it abnormal is it divides too much, but also moves around too much. And those are the characteristics. And the instruction set that tells the cell to behave like that is contained in these proteins. Estrogen receptor is a protein that's made in the cell. The normal breasts have estrogen receptor. Breast cancer cells that are sensitive to estrogen have lots and lots of estrogen receptor protein because the estrogen receptor gene is turned on. Progesterone receptor gene can be turned on, and so on. And pretty much all the things, HER2. Her, the reason that you have some, some cancers have too much HER2 in it is because it has too many HER2 genes. We call that amplification. 
uh, is that it doesn't have just, just, just two HER2 genes, which is normal, but it may have hundreds or even more HER2 genes, and each one of them is making a normal amount of HER2 protein through HER2 RNA, and that's why the cell has too much HER2 in it, for example. Now, we examine this process by something called microarray analysis. And what microarray analysis is, is we look at the RNA level. Not the DNA, not the protein, but at the RNA level for a lot of technical reasons. We could also look at, at, at both the protein and the DNA level, but so most sophisticated application of this technology now is at the RNA level. That's the thing between the signal between the DNA and the protein. So now let's look at this normal cell and this cancer cell at the RNA level. Well, clearly, the normal cell is turned on in terms of making gene A, and the cancer cell is turned off. And the, the, what we, we've decided as a convention that on is red and off is green. I know it should be the other way, okay? <laughs> you don't have to tell me it should be the other way. We all know it should be the other way. Somebody started it this way and it just stuck and we're stuck with it, all right? Gene B, in the normal case, what color would I expect gene B to be when I do microarray analysis? Green, it's off. But gene B is on in the cancer cell, so it's green in the normal cell and red in the cancer cell. Gene C is turned on in the normal cell, okay? And so it's going, to be, it's going to be red. It's not quite as red as gene A because gene C, you see, is just a little turned on where gene A is turned a lot on. So the intensity of the color also tells us somewhat how much the gene is turned on and gene is turned off. C prime, which is the mutant protein, mutant gene, the abnormal gene, is obviously off in the normal situation and a little bit on in the abnormal situation. So when we analyze the RNA in the laboratory, we get pictures with lots of colors that tells us what genes are on and what genes are off, and it's called microarray analysis. Let me show you what a real one looks like. So we're measuring more genes. Along the top are individual cancers. The, each column is an individual cancer, and each row is an individual gene. And you can see that it forms patterns and so this pattern, these are all individual uh, cancers, and it forms a pattern where these genes are turned on. Remember, red is turned on. And these are all estrogen receptor-related genes, estrogen-responsive genes. We call this, these, this collection of tumors, we call them luminal A tumors. Uh, these are what's called luminal B tumors, and the DNA is, uh, for S receptor is a little bit turned on, but there are other genes that are turned on here that are turned off in the luminal A's, and we call these luminal B's, and so on. We now classify breast cancers this way into five types. Uh, luminal A, luminal B are estrogen dependent. Luminal A is more estrogen dependent than luminal B. HER2 dominant, which is these guys over here, these are all HER2 genes. These are the ones that we'd want to use Herceptin on because they really depended upon that. Genes that are a, a kind of cancer that is, doesn't have estrogen turned on and doesn't see no estrogen turned on here and no, uh, no HER2 turned on. So it's negative for HER2, negative for estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors, and we call that triple negative or basal type. Not, it's not exactly, there are basal types that are not triple negative, there's some triple negative and not basal types, but by and large is a good way to think about it. And then there's a collection of, 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 of tumors where the cells look pretty normal. They actually look very much like normal breast cells. And uh, that may be because they're diluted with normal breast cells, the cells are spread very far apart, that's still being studied. Uh, but indeed, luminal A, luminal B, HER2 dominant, and what we call triple negative or basal are fundamental different classifications. The, the luminal A's tend to spread less. The cells are less mobile. The basal type, the cells tend to spread more and fits that example that I showed you before. The basals also tend to divide a lot. The luminal A's tend to divide less and so on. So we're starting to tie the specific DNA, the DNA turning on and off measured at the RNA level with the behavior of the cancer cells. Now to show you the importance of this, just two last slides. Um, is there is one test, one of several that are out there that can be used. Well, this one happens to be called the Archetype DX test. Um, uh, and what this, can, this, this has been studied very, very carefully. And it, it, it measures just a small collection of genes, 21 genes, basically. So it's not hundreds like I showed you before, but just 21. But indeed, it, it, a certain pattern of genes turned on and off 
can, means that, that most of the patients are 10, this is disease-free survival. The, one means that the cancer has not relapsed. You can see most of the patients, even followed out to 12 years, the cancer hasn't relapsed. And if you give these patients, these are patients treated with tamoxifen that affects estrogen receptor. These are all estrogen receptor positive cancers. Uh, if you give them chemotherapy, you actually don't improve the situation because you don't have to, because they do so well anyway just with the tamoxifen hormone therapy. However, if indeed a certain pattern of genes turned on and off is like this, we call it high risk, that the patients who are treated with tamoxifen only um, do okay, but still 40% of them have relapsed with cancer, 60% have not, which means 40% have relapsed with cancer by 12 years. That's not, obviously not satisfactory. But if you give them chemotherapy, you can see how much you can improve their prognosis. So that, so that measuring the genes, and I can show you other examples of other tests that can be used that could do similar things. Measuring genes can, can give you some handle on prognosis, but also on response to treatment. This also works for lymph node, for, for what I showed you before were situations where the cancer had not involved the lymph nodes. It was more recently shown that if the cancer does involve the lymph nodes, it still works. So that indeed the prognosis out to 10 years is, is much better if they have a low risk profile. If they have a high risk profile, the prognosis is worse, but they can be made better with chemotherapy. And much more work is going on in this area now to define uh, what are the genes that make cancers responsive to different chemotherapies, for example. Should they, everybody be treated with the same drugs or should we use different drugs in different people? And um, depending upon the gene profiles. Much of this work is still cooking, it's still science, it's still research, it's not ready yet necessarily for clinical application. But it is influencing our thinking in individual cases as well. And every day we're learning more and more. And, and if there's one take-home message, this is all my slides, now you poor things have to look at me. If there's one take-home message here uh, from all of this, it's that um, a lot has happened in this last year. A lot has happened in this last two weeks. A lot's going to happen in this next two weeks and in this next year. This is an extremely rapidly moving time in understanding breast cancer and being able to use the information we're gaining from breast cancer to be able to make decisions on patients, to pick the right drugs, to decide that we don't need chemotherapy, that hormone therapy alone is adequate for some people, uh, and many other things that we're learning. We're learning a lot about the biology that we didn't expect before. We've got all new thinking going on now. We're learning a lot about how to analyze the biology in a way that actually influences uh, how we can make advances and how we can help individual patients. So that, so that this is just a very exciting time. The future is moving in your direction. The future is moving in all of our direction because it really is moving very rapidly toward uh, the kind of future that we all want, which is the disappearance of breast cancer and hence all cancers. Uh, that's the important thing to keep in mind, that it's not classical anatomic understanding, which I started my first few slides, but a molecular understanding that's really transforming our view of the disease.